start in uh, verse 130, and we're going to read through verse 133 tonight. The interest of thy words giveth light. It gives understanding unto the simple. I opened my mouth and panted, for I long for thy commandments. Look thou upon me and be merciful unto me, as thou used to do unto those that love thy name. Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. So let's, let's just start at the first verse here. Uh, the entrance, the word entrance, entrance of thy word, the word entrance there actually means an entrance. It means an opening. Some, some of the word studies said that it was like a door, an opening of a door. And that entrance of his words gives light. It illumin it illuminates it. It brings light to those who are simple. We'll talk about the simple and understanding to the simple. But to, to look at this more thoroughly, let's go into another place. This is where, because I'm I'm, I see this in a couple of ways, because you have to, again, when you keep the context of this psalm, you understand he's looking forward as a man under the commandments and the law to the time where that law would be fulfilled, where the commandments would be realized. So, we take this forward looking at this particular verse and we get, go to Luke chapter one and we look at verse 78. And this is the prophecy that was given concerning him through the tender mercies of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. And he's speaking of all men. He's not just speaking of Jews here. He's speaking of all men who were in the shadow of death, who were dead in sin. You could say that way, but he came as the day spring. That's the dawning of the day from on high to give light to them that sit in darkness and to guide our feet into the way of peace. And Jeremiah chapter five says this, speaking of the simple, uh, but you will also see, isn't it? I think when you looked at uh, Simeon, when he sees, and then uh, Anna, when she comes in, she speaks of him as they talk to her about that. He would be the light to the Gentiles. And to me, this is what he's talking about. The entrance of thy words. And when you, when you study it out, uh, I don't like to, you know, go into just word studies, but when you study it out, you see that it uses here the plural of words, the interests of thy words. But a lot of them said that it's speaking of the words of scripture, all of the words of the commandments. But you remember what Jesus says, they are they, the plurality of the commandments, plurality of the words, the scripture in its plurality, in its plurality of, words, of words, testify of me, bringing it down to a singleness, to singularity, and saying the plurality of the words were not about a plurality of things. They were a testimony of a singular object, one reality, and it's who I am. And that one comes and brings true illumination to all of those words. He gives the full understanding of every word that God has ever spoken. And that's really what Hebrews chapter one says, all the ways that God spoke through the multitudes of ways in diverse manners and diverse times, he has now summarized all of those words in their plurality in one amen, in one one word, his son. And that's the day spring who's visited us. That's the one who came to give light to those who are in darkness. But it says that he comes to give understanding to the simple. And I want to talk about simple for a moment. Because um, there's a bunch of scripture, especially in Proverbs. When you're looking in Proverbs, it talks about, it, it speaks of the simple ones quite a bit. And it's always, they are put up in contrast to the wisdom of God. And 
Jeremiah chapter 5, 21 says, Hear now this, O foolish people, which is what the word simple means, and those without understanding, who have eyes and see not, who have ears and hear not. Remember, Jesus in Matthew 13 brings this out and basically says that about the, the, the Pharisees that he speaks to only in parables because it was not given to them to know the things of the kingdom because they have they're dull of hearing. They have eyes that do not see and ears that do not hear. And he says, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, repent, be converted, and I will heal them of their blindness and their deafness. So when he's speaking of foolish people, that gives us kind of a glimpse of who he's talking about, the simple. And interestingly, I think the psalmist is taking himself into consideration when he's speaking about the simple, those who are foolish. One of the studies said that, that I looked at said that the, those who were simple were more susceptible and vulnerable to deception. That's who he comes to. Those who see these things with their natural eyes, but cannot see the things of God because they're trying to perceive it with the wrong faculties. Those are the simple. Those are those who have not the understanding of God. It's the same thing that Paul says. They being ignorant of the righteousness of God go about to establish their own. Why? Because they're foolish in the things of the spirit. So they try to transpose their efforts towards righteousness upon God's righteousness and call them the same. So with this, what he's saying here is there is of necessity, the unfolding, which is another meaning for the entrance It's an unfolding of the word of God who brings light and understanding to those who are simple. It's an unfolding or full disclosure of the plurality of the words in the singleness of a person. This is what he's crying out for. Same thing we've been saying throughout this, this psalm. And this is what he understood to be necessary as a man under the law. This is what he's been crying out for. And we'll see that longing that he had, the desire towards this that he had in his heart. But Let's look at the word, the, the thought of the simple ones for a moment. Uh, Proverbs chapter one, verse 22. This is based, it's, it's usually always wi wisdom asking these questions. How long, simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge. Now, see, when we talk about simplicity, like the simplicity of Christ, we're talking about something different than what this is referring to. He's talking about foolishness. You could say fools. How long will you love your foolishness? And what does it mean to love your own foolishness? Love your simplicity. Why do they love their foolishness? Well, the answer is because man's foolishness always makes room for his delusion. And it always makes room for his arrogance. That's good. These were, I mean, he's talking to men who were hiding in the illusion of their own wisdom, their own righteousness, and their imagination of having attained it by works and efforts. Fools. Does that reflect what Paul would say in Galatians? We'll talk about that in a moment. Mm -hmm. But he's talking to believers because we can still live in that type of foolishness, even if we have the righteousness of God dwelling in us. But in this context, we're talking about those who did not have the righteousness of God, but were believing they were righteous because they did the thing that made them feel like they had attained it. That's simple. That's foolish. So when first John chapter five, verse 20, when we read that, it says, we know the son of God has come and has give us an understanding. 
so that we may know him who is true and that we are in him that is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. The coming of the son of God, and we'll get back to the simple, but this, this is a point we need to make. The coming of the son is to give understanding, but understanding of what? The understanding of the true the understanding of that which is genuine, not that which man's delusions has built for himself to boast in. He's brought the understanding of what is eternally true, what God had as his original thought and intention. And that's the understanding he brings in his coming. And he does that so that we who receive him could come to know the one who is true because we are now in the one who is the genuine article. And what that means when you see that is those of us who are in the true, look that word up. It's an amazing word. The real, the genuine. How in the world can we ever believe that we can go beyond that indwelling presence and attain anything beyond that? That there is even a necessity for that type of thing except the ongoing knowing of the one who is the true, the inward recognition, the soul coming to uh, grow in the acknowledgement of the true that is in us. That's our part. And we'll talk about that in a moment with the two expectations here, but his coming was also not just to give an understanding of that which was the sub substantiating reality beyond the shadows. His coming was also to be the door into real fellowship, real relationship with the true God. And by that joining together, his spirit dwelling in our soul, he comes as God's eternal meaning into us. God's def defining substance that was from the beginning. Remember we talked about it, I don't know, a couple of classes. I think it was in a discussion after the class, actually. But we talked about that when it says that the word was with God in the beginning, the word was with God. The word there, logos, or logos means the definition. It means the word and all that, the mind, the thought, but it also means the definition. In the beginning was God's definition. Who else can bring understanding to the foolish, the simple, those without understanding, except the one who was the original meaning and defining of everything God ever had in his mind? Fools long. Simple ones long to cling and grasp their abstract illusions. The church world's full of a lot of abstract things. I hear people talk a lot about things that are just not substantial. They're, they're abstract. We don't know where this ends. We don't know when this begins. We don't know if this is happening yet, or, you know, there's all these loose ends and dangling participles out there. So what's real? Because if you hold on to an abstract delusion, something that really has no verifiable proof, it leaves, again, room for your delusion. It leaves room for you, as Paul would say in the second chapter of Colossians, they're able to step into those things which they see and by it be puffed up in their own fleshly mind. Now, I know the King James says things they cannot see, but the actual word is they see them. These are visible things, things their eyes can see and their hands can touch, and they can get involved in it like circumcision, holy days, festivals. And they step into those things trying to fill them up with their own selves. And in them, they are fooling. They're delusional. And that's why he warns the believers in the Colossian believers, he warns them, do not be swayed by the vain philosophies of men. 
Do not be deluded. Do not be as a simpleton. Do not be foolish enough to fall for this because you are in Christ, complete, needing nothing to add to that completeness. So the foolish always love their illusions, those abstract things, the things that they can define themselves in their own natural mind, because the true thing leaves no room for that. It leaves no place for the foolish men to play and boast. So when Paul speaks to the simple or the foolish who are leaning upon their own righteousness by law, he writes this in Romans chapter two. He says, you think yourself to be an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes who has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. And the funny thing is Paul is kind of showing an irony here that these are instructing who they supposed to be fools or simple when they themselves are fools. That's the point he's making. You are blind leaders of the blind. You're foolish teachers of fools because you hold to a form of knowledge and a form of the truth in the law, but you will not come to the true thing. Why? Because you want to hold to your form. You want to hold to the abstract testimonial thing that you think you can fill up with your own efforts and works. You can define righteousness any way you deem fit. Unfortunately, that's Christianity today. You can define these things however you want. That's why you have a million denominations, a hundred different movements. You have all these different, you know, splinters. But God has one truth. God has one meaning, definition for every single thing. And it's not found in the form of knowledge that was even in the law. It is found in the true thing that has come. And the fools wanted to hold on to that. And he calls them fools when they are thinking they are teachers of fools to wisen them up. And he says, you're foolish just like they are. And he speaks to this also, and this is a, a big one we all know. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verse 18, I know I'm going through a lot of verses, but we can, you write them down you go to them later, or listen to it later. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolish, but unto us, which are saved, it is the power of God. Now, who's he talking about? Those who perish, those who were in death, those who are, as, as he said earlier, the one who came to those who sit in darkness and who were in death, that's the perishing all men. Mankind looks in his natural mind, looks at the preaching of the cross and thinks it's foolish. It's simple. It's ignorant. But unto us who are saved, who have actually had the work of that cross active in our hearts, it is God's power. Amen. Verse 19, because, and I'm doing a kind of a side study right now on the preaching of the cross, and I'm, we'll talk about it at some point in time, but for it is written, but you see the whole concept here. It is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, bring to nothing the understanding of, of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where's the disputer in this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Do you see again the contrast? What is foolish? Is it the preaching of the cross or is it man's understanding that the cross itself has made foolish? null and void, and made foolish. What's truly foolish? See, the preaching of the cross to those who are in a state of death is foolish. But God by the cross, in the coming of Christ to bring salvation in the way that he has brought salvation, has really exposed 
the foolishness of what the world calls wisdom. And in a lot of ways, you could say he's exposed what religious men call righteousness. You could say he exposes the foolishness of boasting in a righteousness that is by the law, because he did that. This was, these were the Jews that also called it foolish. What is the reality of God? Are you in Christ? And that's what the foolish fight of God, not of us. Because that encapsulates the reality of the preaching of the cross. When we talk about the preaching of the cross for so many years, we've talked about the preaching of the cross, and we have deemed it to be uh, 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 basically a mechanism by which we die to self, put away our bad parts and accumulate good parts, and there's less of me and more of Jesus, and I'm dying and dying, and I've got to die, and I'm still not dead yet. That's the preaching of the cross is the way we've looked at it. The preaching of the cross is the declaration of the very thing Paul says at the end of this chapter of God. Are you in Christ Jesus who is made unto us? Why is that? Why is the preaching of the cross such an offense? Cause it says God did this and you didn't. Amen. God did this Amen. because you can't. He has had to make his son to be in us what was absolutely impossible for wis for man's wisdom to ever concoct a way to do it. Man's wisdom can't reach that high. Man's ability can't do it. That's why the preaching of the cross is of such offense. That's why it's foolish to some men. You know why? Because it disregards man and all of his efforts and calls them nothing calls them nothing. And yet, I mean, listen to these words. It's not of him that runs, him that wheels, but of God who shows mercy. That is the preaching of the cross. God has to show mercy because it doesn't matter how much you wheel or how fast you run. God's mercy is the only thing that brings you to the goal. Amen. That's the reality that the foolish, the simple fight against. And that's why he's saying your word is the only thing that can illuminate the simple. So we're not just talking about those who are under the law, however, because his coming did that. His coming brought the full disclosure and the full enlightenment of God's word, God's law, God's commandments. Look at Matthew chapter 5 and 6, and you'll see that. He, he just illuminated the whole of the law in its full intention and says, you've heard that said, but here's what it really means. And he did that. And that was a full disclosure of the fulfilling of the law, because that's exactly what he said. I didn't come to do away with it. I came to fulfill it. So he came to define it in all of its fullness. He came as the full meaning of it. That's the illumination of the word in his coming. But he does that in our hearts as well. And so Paul would address this same state of foolishness and simplicity in that, in the, uh, as I do like Sparks would say, in the negative sense, not in the positive sense of simplicity, like we talk about the simplicity of Christ. But Paul addresses this to Christians who, who are being somewhat persuaded to look to the law and try to attain some righteousness by it. So what does he call the Galatians in chapter 3? Foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? See, not obey the true thing before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Receive you the spirit by the works of the law. Who actually brought this internal change about? Did it happen by the law or did it happen by faith? Are you so foolish that having begun in the spirit, you 
are now made perfect by the flesh. See, they were foolish, ignorant of what God had bestowed to them in the person of Christ. And a simple person, again, is vulnerable to deception. Not deception just from the outside forces, but self-deception is the greatest enemy. When you have a self-defined righteousness, you are self-deceived. That's why God has to open our eyes to see beyond our own face to see a reality that cannot be defined in us at all because reality isn't defined in us at all. Because what he's trying to show them is you can be in Christ because they were, he never questioned that. But you can be in Christ and still live as a fool. Still live as a simple one. What does that mean? Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Are you now by your works improving upon that completion that he performed and that he perpetuates in you by his presence? That's foolish. That's simpletons. That's those who would say, God's work in me was not sufficient. I have to do something more. And this is the foolishness that can still exist and does still exist in the mind of so many, in the majority, I would say. And that's why those who are partakers of God's wisdom and the indwelling person of the eternal word must have that person of wisdom, that eternal word revealed in our hearts, unfolded to our souls in all of his beauty. So that we would, we would see him and realize in that one is the consummate reality that God always had in mind. And we'd understand the absurdity of ever trying to bring ourselves into that picture or that argument ever again. And we don't do that as those who are missing out. We do those as those who have come to this complete absolute reality that anchors us, even though we still in our mind don't realize how sure that anchor holds us, but we press on to know we set our hearts to know because we have to know, and this is what the spirit of God makes us to know in the showing of his son to us that we possess a salvation a righteousness, a relationship with God that is not of our own doing, but is of God's doing and only God's doing. Not I, but Christ is an absolute enemy to the foolish. Yeah. It's an enemy. And it's an enemy to most believers who are still in that state of simpleton or simplicity because not I, but Christ is still taught by so many to be a destination we're still going toward instead of the place we start. When you are, when you begin in Christ, when he dwells in, you know what he does? He measures your soul and defines it in himself. He determines your soul's condition from that moment on. Not I, but Christ is your soul's condition from the moment you are born of God. And it doesn't change. We just grow in a greater and greater understanding of it. Our soul becomes clearer as to what that means. You know, I talk, you know, I talk to people a lot about these things. However, you hear them say things like, well, I won't say particular things, but you will hear them talk. And you will say, they're still wrestling with what does it mean, not I, but Christ? Because they're still, you, you know how we take something, we think we're spiritual when we're, when we're thinking it, but then we realize, my God, 
that sounded so good to me at one point in time, but now I see that it had me right dab in the middle of it the whole time. And I thought that I was glorifying God and I was actually puffing up my own self. I've done that. I've tried to define the work of the spirit and still twisted it in a way where I would get some glory and be able to boast in it. And none of that's, none of that's permitted in this reality. And that's why this man is crying out for God's word, the meaning to finally come and give understanding. Um, you could say it this way and we'll move on to the other part, but heaven's disclosure of the sun in his first coming, uh, brought, let's see, how can you say it? Brought delight God's ultimate intention. He came as God's full revelation of, of his mind. I mean, uh, what does the verse say? No man has seen God at any time, but the son has, what revealed him? I think that's the word. The bosom of the Father. What? It, what is it? Who's in the bosom of the Father? Yeah, has revealed him, right? Right. Declared yeah. him. Declared him. And that word means to fully give full explanation of. It's the word exegete, where we can say we exegete scripture. So it's the full explanation of it. That's who he came as. The full explanation, the full and thorough uh, manifestation of God's mind, his thoughts throughout all previous ages. And that's basically what John means when he says the word became flesh and was among us because that word was now personified. The meaning that God had throughout ages yeah. eternal was now personified in a person. And that's the coming that this psalmist is crying out for. Um, now, let's let's read the next uh, part of this verse, or the next verse. I opened my mouth and panted, for I long for thy commandments. Now, this is, again, something that we've basically covered a few times, this, this thought, this, this idea. You'll see... You remember in the Psalms, David also talks about the deer panting after the water brook. So my soul pants after thee, O God. Well, that's the same panting that he's talking about here. Uh, and we're going to read a verse in a moment that I think really captures what he's talking about. But the idea here is that, you know, there's this animal that is, has run and most would say he's, you know, running from this from whatever's coming after him, but he's just parched, whatever he's exhausted and he needs water. He needs, he needs something. He needs that's the deer pan is after the water broke. So his mouth is wide open and he needs something and he longs for something. And what this man is longing for is the commandments of God, but not the commandments to always perpetually be a letter. But now those commandments to come and be realized in their true meaning, their true intent. We talked about that in the last, the last session and come to finally be resident in his soul. My soul would keep them, he says. So he is one who is with open mouth panting. And one of the word studies I looked at, and I thought it was interesting, said it was most of the time is talking about panting from sheer exhaustion. And to me, when I read that, it was like a light came on. Well, that's exactly what, you know, Jesus comes to the Pharisees and he says, you who labor are heavy laden. Basically he's talking to a people who are exhausted. When, when Paul writes in Galatians chapter one, and he says, you know, God has, God has separated you, but you wanted to go back that about this present evil world, the world, most people read that in Galatians chapter one, when he speaks of this present evil world. And we think 
this world right here. And we look at it and we say, yeah, it's pretty, pretty evil. But the word evil means laborious. It means full of toil and labor. That's what that word evil there means. He's talking about an age that had them exhausted in their labor and their toils under the law. Why? He's asking the Galatians, why in the world would you go to that? Why would you look for anything there? And the the psalmist here is understanding there's no reality there, is testifying of a reality. But remember what he said, I am like a bottle in the smoke. That is a bottle dried up, having no moisture in it at all. And he's saying here, I am panting for it with open mouth, panting for your commandments, panting for the word to be realized, for it to finally be personified and brought into me. I could say maybe internalized where it can be life in me and not just commandments to me. So he's really speaking as a soul that is laboring and running under an expectational desire. Of course he has that, but he has, but he has not, even with that enjoyed the satisfaction of the very thing he's desiring. And what was the, you know, just as the water was the missing analogy with the, with the deer that pants after the water, the commandments, the meaning and conclusion of the law of God is meant here. He is exhausted, needing water, needing sustenance with his mouth wide open, trying to get God to feel him because the law can't feel him. When you hear things like that, especially when most Christians, especially these words, listen to that, man. I'm panting after you. I'm panting after you. And the fear that I have when I read verses like that and people who read them out of context, you know, just like we did in Matthew chapter five, those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, the fear that I have when you see and read these things and you hear people talk about them because it stresses the, that powerful longing, that desire it can easily feed the desire that most Christians have to get, get about it, get busy and do it, you know, get after it for Jesus. But this type of panning he's talking about this type of longing and motivation he's talking about, if that's ours, then that would be an entire disregarding of the gift of grace that God has provided to those of us who believe. It's true. We're going to talk about in a moment because there are two different desires being presented here. There's two desires that we deal with, I'd say, as believers. But again, the longing for Christ, of course, my soul longs to know. My soul longs to grow in a knowledge of the person who's in me, the one who is my life and my righteous. That is a longing that we should have. That's a desire of fellowship that we should grow in and have and possess. But this desire is as one who doesn't have the sustenance. He doesn't have anything. He's wanting something that is missing. Our desire should be to grow in the true knowledge and appreciation internally of that which is present. Jesus says plainly, if he comes to me, those who come to me and receive me will never hunger and never thirst again. So there are two desires here, and that's two desires in the in the, as again, in the positive sense, the scriptures speak of two. There is a desire or a longing towards fulfillment. And then there's the longing or desire of those who are in fulfillment. Those are two different ones. 
And we can't confuse the one with the other. That's the problem that most people have in the church today. They confuse the one with the other. So the church Christians today in whom Christ lives, and this is why most are looking for every mean, means and method they can to be righteous, to have a relationship with God that is perfect, to do the stuff and to you know, get the applause of God and man because they have confused a desire toward fulfillment with the desire of those who are in it. In Christ, our desire toward God, our longing toward God is always prefaced by things such as, and you'll read phrases like this, and there's more, since you are risen, in view of the fact that you are, seeing that this is so, and then it gives what to do. But he always prefaces it by saying, seeing that you are dead with Christ and alive unto God, dot, dot, dot. We seem to miss the whole prefaced reality, that pre-existing thing that anchors us in something that's real, and we just skip over that and go to the do this. That's dangerous. Amen. There's always a previously established truth or certainty attained in Christ, not just promised, but attained in Christ. That is the basis of our desire as believers. There's a reality that is the basis of what we desire and long to know and grow in and, 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 Our desire is not for God to do, but that we may know what he has done. Our longing is toward an ongoing and more perfect comprehension, an internal working and recognition of Christ's sufficiency as God's just say it this way, as God reveals, unveils our hearts to the riches of his son, the riches of who he is. So this psalm is presenting to us a longing toward fulfillment, towards the internalization and actualization of God's spiritual conclusion, the spiritual conclusion of the commandments, because that's exactly who Christ right now is in us and unto us. And that's what this psalmist is crying out for the deer after the water crying out towards an internal fellowship of fulfillment and completion. Well, we don't understand the fact that we are in fulfillment and not waiting for it. Then our desire is twisted. And then we're going to look for ways and means to make it what it already is to attain what he's already provided in Christ. And it can be said of us in that mindset, just like Paul did to the Galatians. Foolish. Are you now going to make more perfect by your flesh, by your works, what God gave you as perfect at the start? So Romans chapter seven, speaking of the same thing, this desire that this man has, and we've, we've talked a lot about how this parallels with Romans seven quite a bit, but in verse 22 of Romans seven, it says, I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now, I want to consider the phrase, I delight in the law of God. After the inward man. That's a strange statement. That's a weird expression, really. 
and I've a long time, I just kind of skipped over that. You just read it and just skip over it. And you say, okay. But it parallels to the desire that's being expressed here in this song. Uh, because this phrase, I delight in the law of God in reference to, which is how it should be in accordance to, or in reference to the inward man. You hear that? I delight in God's law in reference to the inward man. The phrase encapsulates the real desire uh, that Paul had, that this psalmist had. They want to live according to the commandments, but more emphatically, truly, they wanted to have that which the law commands to become inward, to become internalized again as life not just as law demanding upon them, but his life present within them. So when he's delighting in the law of God, he's delighting in it because he's wanting it to become an inward reality. He's wanting it to happen in him. That's what he means. I delight in the law in reference to the inward man. I mean, this is a man surrounded by all the trappings of the testimony and God's law. He was a man that could enumerate his accomplishment and did under that system that more than any other man could. And yet the one thing, the main thing eluded him as a devoted Jew. And that was the internal presence of the spiritual reality the law spoke of. So his longing and his love in, in the confines of the law was not merely to find some superficial, passable form of righteousness. I mean, he, he already said that if it had to do with just touching the righteousness of the law, I was blameless. He could have rested his laurels on that. He could have been fine and dandy with just that, and most Pharisees were. They they had a superficial, passable form of righteousness, and they boasted in it. Paul, however, desired something more. He wanted to possess the purest form of that righteousness described in it, in the law, in his heart, he wanted it in his soul. He wanted it to be life in him, not just commandments, not just words, not just letter. His longing was for such an internal fellowship was the real, was he wanted that fellowship with the real thing, the true, like we talked about. He wanted God's understanding of what all of those words that he had invested his whole life in to come and be present in his heart. He didn't just want a change of attitude, a change of habits, a change of do better. I'll try again next time. He wanted an internal change that brought into his heart that intended relationship with the life that the law testified of, but could not in itself provide. Because he understood there was another law in his members that kept him away, kept that joining from happening. Or you could say, as he does in Romans 7, the soul was already married to another man, already subject to another. So we hear that cry for deliverance. Who would deliver me from this body of death? Basically, Who's going to deliver me from this first man? Well, through Jesus Christ, it, it came. So he says, with the mind, I serve God. And you, if you look at that, it sounds kind of weird. With the mind, I serve God. And with the flesh, I serve, you know, serve sin. <laughs> Basically saying this, the, my heart, my soul serves God as purely as it possible possibly can being yet without the union with the life that is necessary. But once I implement my efforts, my observation, my own obediences, my, whatever, my zeal, the law of sin is shown and made known by that law to be the source 
from which my soul feeds and every activity I'm engaged in proceeds. Every time I interject me into it, every time I put my hand to it, it exposes the evil that is present. And that's what he's saying. With the mind, I serve God. In my heart, it's as pure as it can be, but it's toward reality. I want it to dwell in the inward man. But the moment I put my hand to it, I'm exposed the whole time as being a slave of sin. Who would deliver me? Because he wanted that deliverance to be this, that the soul, that the mind, the heart is the only thing with which I will ever serve God. Because now, touch not, taste not, handle not, all the things that I've implemented, the mechanisms that I had thought to produce righteousness are no longer necessary. Because he's present. And his presence in my heart has brought pure righteousness, pure life. He wanted the incongruence or the, dis the difference between his desire and the reality that was present to go away. He didn't want there to be a difference between the two. He didn't want the desire for righteousness to be thwarted by the presence of sin. He desired it, but it wasn't there. He wanted that to end. And when I'm speaking, that's what I want people to understand, who are in Christ, who are born again, that that type of incompatibility, that thing is done. It's remedied. Your desire toward righteousness and the righteousness of God is present. You don't have to go after a righteousness. He's come to you. You don't have to, you don't have to desire something yet unreachable. He reached you with it because it was unreachable for you. The inward man in this work of grace is filled with the life God looks upon with his complete delight, his complete satisfaction. So that we glory in the Lord and only in him, our mouths, listen, once empty, once parched are full of his full supply of that good thing, that which is good. The good that Paul said, there's no good in me. Because he's talking about the good as God defines it, not good as man defines it. Good as God defined it. There's nothing on earth that can be called that good. Amen. But he's the full supply of that which is good to my soul. And so that's why the psalmist will cry out for mercy once again in these verses. Listen what uh, Psalms 81 says. It's Psalms again, but Psalms 81. This is still talking about the opening of the mouth and panting. Psalms 81, and I'm, I've gone over our time, but there shall no strange God be in thee. This is verse nine. There shall no strange God be in thee. Neither shall thou worship any strange God. I am the Lord, thy God that brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Listen to what he tells them. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. But my people would not hearken to my voice and Israel would have none of me. See, he was the one, and this is what he's reminding them. And this is part of what this psalmist understands in his heart. He was the one who brought them out of Egypt. He did it. Therefore, he calls for them to approach him with the proper posture of dependence. Open your mouth wide to receive from me what only I can provide to you. See, and, and in doing that, and this is what the psalmist is doing, in doing that, they had to recognize their impotence. 
to first get out of the enslavement they were in on their own and by their own power. They had to understand they have no power in themselves to keep them or empower them as as those who have been delivered. So they must trust God and trust God alone. That's what he's saying to them. I, I brought you out. Now, open your mouth wide. That is a posture of absolute dependence. That's like a baby bird looking up at his mother, open wanting the worm wide. that only that mother can give. Why? Because I'm too weak to go get it myself. Yep. Yep. Open your mouth. I'll give you the thing you can't get on your own. But in the opening of a mouth, what is that? That is an admittance of your weakness. It's an admittance that you are in full dependence upon him to do and give and provide what you don't have or can't have otherwise. So when he says, I asked, I called them to me to open their mouth, open your mouth and I will fill it. He says, but they would not hearken to my voice and they would have none of me. I mean, what a, that's a, that's a pitiful picture, but that's the same picture that Jesus poses to them in John. When he says, you search the scripture, they testify of me, but you won't come to me with your mouth wide open that I can give you life because whatever you do, according to that word, while commendable in the flesh will never satiate your heart. It will never satisfy your soul. If you'll open your mouth to me as one who is in full dependence upon me, I will give you what only I can. Have I froze up again? No. No. Okay. All right. No. Every, everything went dark and silent there for a second. Okay. Uh, it was intended, this verse, this, this thing was intended to expose uh, their emptiness their hunger. That's what the commandments were to do because it was to say, you don't yet have the thing I'm talking about, but it's coming. Open your mouth and receive from me. Stop thinking you can do this on your own. I will do this in you. I will bring this about. This was when he had to understand, I can't do it. The law was to do this, and it was to do this to expose emptiness, vanity, hunger, lack of substance, sustenance, in order to drive man to God with an open mouth. Drive man to God confessing all deficiency in self, all weakness, and full dependence upon God to provide his bread from heaven. The desperation that men had under the power of sin or have under the power of sin and death, you never seem to hear that. I mean, they'll, they'll scare you with a hundred different things like burning forever and all that stuff. But those men are told, just, just come accept Jesus and just try him out. Come and say this rehearsed and pre-written sinner's prayer and see if God won't just help you and change your life and make your circumstances pleasing. But they don't hear. Here's what you don't hear. You don't hear you're dead in sin. Your righteousness that you claim because of good works are filthy as a woman's menstrual rag. Your best has evil as its source. You cannot meet God's standard no matter how hard you try. You're hopeless unless you call upon the grace and mercy of God. See, that's what men need to hear. If they are not born again, they don't need to hear, just come to Jesus, try him out, and he'll, he'll forgive you. No, they need to know the desperation they're in. They need to understand the darkness they're sitting in. Because then they can understand what God has performed. 
see, if we don't understand just death, darkness, corruption was our state from birth, then when we get born again, which is life and incorruptibility, the resurrection itself, eternal life, all the riches of heaven in Christ and Christ in me, then you know what we're going to say? What else is there? God is what, when is the good stuff coming? Well, when's that real thing finally going to arrive? That's the problem the church is having. When he speaks of, In Matthew 5, just the same as this, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. It's the same thing that he's saying in this psalm. I am thirsting, panting, longing with an open mouth for your righteousness. He says commandments, but he's talking about the righteousness that is in those commandments, the righteousness of the law itself. And Jesus says, if you hunger and thirst after that, if that's your posture, then come to me, open your mouth, and you will be filled with it. That's the desperation that we all had. That's that's the emptiness and the vanity that we come to God with. But see, the beauty of it, the beauty of our salvation, the thing that fulfills what this psalmist is longing for is that Christ in us has filled our mouth with that which is good. He has filled our soul's desire. He has brought to pass in our hearts what was the desire of all nations, And the longing we should have now, the open mouth that we should have now, is let me know him. Let me see your son. Cause my soul to grow in this grace that you have bestowed. A grace that has given me all spiritual fullness by making your son to be unto me all things. That's the completion that we boast in. That's the thing we stand firm in. And so we'll stop there, guys.